on World News Tonight. Farmers March. Indian farmers take to the streets in a 200-kilometer march protesting new onion prices. Potential crisis. Credit Suisse takes precautionary measure to avert a global financial meltdown. Dangerous waters. The DPRK fires an ICBM towards the East Sea in a first launch of such magnitude. A bliss in bloom. A colorful flower show adds luster to Hong Kong. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're joining us on World News Not Tonight. Broadcast leads from our neighboring India where distressed farmers in the western Maharashtra Strait are on an emerging 200-kilometer march to demand compensation for the losses in onion crops because of the sharp plunge in the prices. Prices of the crop have fallen to as low as 200 rupees per 100 kilograms prompting some farmers to dump the crops in fields of Mahashastra, the largest producer of red onions in the country, where rates have fallen sharply. Tens of thousands of protesting farmers led by a regional party were seen trudging on the road in Nashik district and said that they were determined to walk to the capital Mumbai city to convey their demands to the government. The Indian government said that it has directed two of its agencies to immediately intervene and purchase red onion crops from the market after prices fell significantly over the last month, resulting in protests by farmers. However, the farmers have rejected the relief proposal and said that the government failed to support them with the bare minimum prices of $24 per quintal for the crop. India is the world's biggest exporter of onion, primarily meeting the demand of Asian countries, including Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal and Malaysia. Over in the west of India, the drama continues as former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan greeted his supporters outside his Lahore residence after police were ordered to suspend an operation to arrest him amid a violent standoff around the compound. Khan was pictured in one video wearing a gas mask as he spoke and took pictures with those who had gathered outside his property. Pakistan security forces withdrew from around Imran Khan's home on Wednesday after a court ordered them to suspend an operation to arrest him. Clashes had erupted between police and Khan's supporters after officials tried to detain the former prime minister. Security forces had fired tear gas and water cannons at hundreds of Khan's supporters, who had cordoned off his home in an effort to prevent his arrest. Police say a court in Islamabad ordered Khan's arrest for not appearing before it, despite repeated summons in relation to selling state gifts given by foreign dignitaries during his premiership. Pakistan's election commission found him guilty in the matter, and now a criminal inquiry is underway, though Khan says he broke no rules. Police and other security personnel were seen leaving the Lahore neighborhood where Khan's home is located on Wednesday. A senior police official said the operation to arrest Khan had been paused to accommodate a cricket tournament in the Pakistan Super League being played nearby. Aaj. Khan accused the incumbent government of attempts on his life in a video released by his party, Pakistan Tariqi and Saif. His life was in danger, he said, claiming that Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, Interior Minister Rana Sanaula, and an intelligence agent had planned tear gas shelling on his home. After forces withdrew, Khan was seen standing outside his home wearing a gas mask and talking to supporters. The violence has added to the instability in the country, which is struggling with an economic crisis and awaiting an International Monetary Fund bailout. Now, in the latest event of global economic turmoil, Credit Suisse had said that it would borrow up to $54 billion from the Swiss Central Bank to show up liquidity and investor confidence after a slump in its shares intensified fears about a global banking crisis. The mid-air collision between a U.S. spy drone and a Russian fighter jet in international airspace prompted a rare direct call between military leaders in Washington and Moscow. I just got off the phone with my Russian counterpart, Minister Shoigu. <clears throat> U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Wednesday said he'd spoken with Russia's defense minister about the incident, where a Russian Su-27 aircraft the day before intercepted, struck, and damaged the propeller of an American MQ-9 Reaper drone, forcing operators to crash it into the waters of the Black Sea. 
and the United States will continue to fly and to operate wherever international law allows. And it is incumbent upon Russia to operate his military aircraft in a safe and professional manner. U.S. officials said two Russian jets first harried and dumped fuel on the unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV, before the collision. U.S. General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said it was not yet clear whether the crash was intentional or accidental. Milley said the Pentagon had video evidence of the encounter and would consider declassifying parts of it. But Russia's defense ministry claimed the American drone was heading toward Russian-held territory and said there was no collision, asserting the MQ-9 crashed all on its own. The downing of the drone marks the first such incident since Russian forces invaded Ukraine over a year ago, a conflict that has seen a steadily increasing amount of U.S. weaponry, operated mostly by Ukrainians, clashing with Russian armaments. Russia said it would try to recover the drone wreckage from the sea. General Milley said the waters where the MQ-9 splashed down were four to 5,000 feet deep, making any recovery attempt difficult. He added that measures were taken before the crash to ensure no sensitive information could be gleaned from the wreckage. The Russian and U.S. defense ministers had a phone call a day after a U.S. military drone crashed over the Black Sea in an incident Washington called unsafe and reckless. While rumors fly wild of a potential retaliatory move by Washington, nothing has been confirmed yet. The mid-air collision between a U.S. spy drone and a Russian fighter jet in international airspace prompted a rare direct call between military leaders in Washington and Moscow. I just got off the phone with my Russian counterpart, Minister Shoigu. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Wednesday said he'd spoken with Russia's defense minister about the incident, where a Russian Su-27 aircraft the day before intercepted, struck, and damaged the propeller of an American MQ-9 Reaper drone, forcing operators to crash it into the waters of the Black Sea. And the United States will continue to fly and to operate wherever international law allows. And it is incumbent upon Russia to operate his military aircraft in a safe and professional manner. U.S. officials said two Russian jets first harried and dumped fuel on the unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV, before the collision. U.S. General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said it was not yet clear whether the crash was intentional or accidental. Milley said the Pentagon had video evidence of the encounter and would consider declassifying parts of it. But Russia's defense ministry claimed the American drone was heading toward Russian-held territory and said there was no collision, asserting the MQ-9 crashed all on its own. The downing of the drone marks the first such incident since Russian forces invaded Ukraine over a year ago, a conflict that has seen a steadily increasing amount of U.S. weaponry, operated mostly by Ukrainians, clashing with Russian armaments. Russia said it would try to recover the drone wreckage from the sea. General Milley said the waters where the MQ-9 splashed down were four to 5,000 feet deep, making any recovery attempt difficult. He added that measures were taken before the crash to ensure no sensitive information could be gleaned from the wreckage. As tensions reach a boiling point in the east, North Korea fired a suspected intercontinental ballistic missile into the sea between the Korean Peninsula and Japan hours before South Korea's president was due to fly to Tokyo for a summit expected to discuss ways to counter the nuclear-armed North. North Korea's fourth show of force in a week. North Korea fired another ballistic missile off to the East Sea, and this time it was a long-range missile, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff confirmed on Thursday morning. It was fired at a high angle and flew about 1,000 kilometers east. Japan's defense ministry said that the missile traveled for about 69 minutes and reached a maximum altitude of 6,000 kilometers. It added that the missile landed around 250 kilometers west of Hokkaido Prefecture's Oshima Island. Analysts gathered from the flight data that this could be an intercontinental ballistic missile, likely the Hwasong-17. The Hwasong-17 is North Korea's largest nuclear-capable missile to date. It's also the world's biggest liquid-fueled ICBM that can be moved on roads. Last year, Japanese Defense Minister Yasukazu Hamada mentioned that this weapon has the capability to reach the U.S. mainland with a potential range of 15,000 kilometers. 
But South Korea's military officials said that although this launch does bear some similarities to the Hwasong-17, they also did find some differences that could suggest otherwise, although these details cannot be disclosed at the moment. If this test did involve an ICBM, this would mark North Korea's seventh successful ICBM test since 2017. North Korea's latest weapons test comes on the day of South Korea and Japan's bilateral summit and before President Yoon suk yeol embarked on his two-day visit to Tokyo. Their timing hints that North Korea is disgruntled by the rekindled relationship between Seoul and Tokyo. This is to prevent and rally against the strengthened trilateral alliance between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan. They think that this could pose a greater threat to their regime. There is also the Freedom Shield, the largest Seoul Washington war games in years. That's now into its fourth day. And North Korea is also holding its own annual training at the moment, all taking part alongside North Korea's lively firearms show and tell. The National Security Council on Thursday morning responded to North Korea's recent threats. National Security Advisor Kim Sung An held an emergency standing committee with key players, including President Yoon suk yeol before his flight. The standing committee members stressed that this latest launch is a clear violation of UN security resolutions and a threat to peace. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Britain's Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt said that Britain's economy is set to avoid a recession in 2023, but will still contract this year as he made a budget speech, which included measures to speed up economic growth and extend support for household energy bills. Britain's economy will avoid a recession this year. That was the message sent by Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt on Wednesday during his budget speech. But he warned the economy would still contract in 2023. Today, the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts that because of changing international factors and the measures I take, the UK will not now enter a technical recession this year. Yeah! Hunt said gross domestic product is forecast to shrink by 0.2% this year, better than the 1.4% decline projected in November. Energy costs have come down since late last year and there has been some signs of recovery in economic data. But Britain is the only group of seven economy yet to recover its pre-health crisis size. It's already gone through a decade of near stagnant income growth before the health crisis hit while inflation is still above 10%. Hunt ruled out a major spending spree or big tax cuts in his budget plan. He says restoring stability has been the priority since he took over at the finance ministry in the autumn following the brief but chaotic premiership of Liz Truss last summer. But Hunt confirmed a three-month extension of energy bill subsidies for households. He also extended a decade-long fuel duty freeze and announced new support for childcare. Now, despite the efforts taken by the British government to curb workers suffering, hundreds of thousands of British workers are on strike in what is believed to be the biggest walkout since the current wave of industrial action began. Teachers, university lecturers, civil servants, junior doctors and BBC journalists are amongst those taking to picket lines around the country to coincide with Budget Day. These doctors have been striking since Monday as have tens of thousands of their colleagues across England. At £14.09 an hour, they say a newly qualified doctor earns less than pret a coffee shop staff. Years of below inflation pay increases mean they've effectively had a 26% wage cut since 2008, a situation exacerbated by the UK's cost of living crisis. Meanwhile, the workload and patient waiting lists are at record highs, driving scores of doctors away from the public health service with burnout. I've worked and trained for years and years, built up debt, paying for exams, paying for fees, and I can't afford to live a basic life. Their grievances echo across the public sector, with hundreds of thousands of workers walking off the job today, 
calling for their wages to keep up with rocketing inflation, which remains above 10 per cent. A two-day stoppage by teachers is expected to affect every school in England. And the walkout by train staff in London left the entire underground tube network at a standstill. Unions show little sign of ending the strikes that began last year, but the government continues to resist their demands. It says it wants to work with unions to achieve, quote, fair and reasonable pay rises, but only if strike action ends. The Biden administration has people questioning where the priorities of the U.S. government lies as it demanded that TikTok's Chinese owners divest their stakes in the popular video app or face a possible U.S. ban. The move is the most dramatic in a series of recent steps by U.S. officials and legislators who have raised fears that TikTok's U.S. user data could be passed on to China's government. The Biden administration has threatened to ban TikTok if its Chinese owners do not sell their stake the company told Reuters on Wednesday. The ultimatum, first reported in the Wall Street Journal, comes amid fears that the app could pass US user data to the Chinese government. TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance, has more than 100 million users in the US. A TikTok spokesperson told Reuters that the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States had demanded that the Chinese owners of the app sell their shares. 60% of ByteDance shares are owned by global investors, 20% by employees, and 20% by its founders, according to the journal. TikTok, which rejects the spying allegations, says it has spent more than $1.5 billion on rigorous data security efforts. On Wednesday, it added, quote, The best way to address concerns about national security is with the transparent U.S.-based protection of U.S. user data and systems, with robust third-party monitoring, vetting and verification. Last week, the White House backed a bill that gives it new powers to ban TikTok and other foreign-based technologies if they pose a national security threat. Biden's predecessor, Republican Donald Trump, tried to ban TikTok in 2020, but was blocked by the courts. Another hurdle would be that any U.S. company buying TikTok would also require the approval of the Chinese government, and it's not clear that it would be granted. The White House declined to comment. Guo Wengui, a fugitive bi a Chinese billionaire, was arrested in New York on charges that he orchestrated a complex conspiracy to defraud thousands of his online followers out of at least $1 billion. Mr. Guo, whose alias is Miles Kwok, is a business associate of Stephen K. Bannon, a one-time top advisor to former President Donald Trump. The exiled Chinese businessman Guo Wengui was charged on Wednesday with leading a complex conspiracy to defraud his online followers out of more than $1 billion. According to authorities, Guo, with help from his longtime financial advisor, Kin Ming Jae, cheated thousands by promising outsized investment returns, but diverted much of their money to fund lavish lifestyles for himself and his family. A prominent critic of China's Communist Party, Guo left the country in 2014 during an anti-corruption crackdown under President Xi Jinping. He was accused there of crimes including bribery and money laundering, but has denied wrongdoing. In the U.S., Guo has been a business associate of Steve Bannon, a former advisor to Donald Trump. Bannon was arrested in a fraud case in August 2020 while aboard Guo's yacht, the Lady May. He was later pardoned by Trump in the final hours of his presidency. Guo, who was arrested on Wednesday, faces 11 criminal counts that include securities fraud wire fraud and concealment of money laundering, carrying several decades of potential prison time. Following the arrest, a fire broke out on the 18th floor of the Sherry Netherland Hotel, where Guo has an apartment on Manhattan's Upper East Side. There were no reported injuries. On Thursday afternoon, Guo pleaded not guilty and is being detained without bail. A lawyer for Guo did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. An explosion caused by accumulated gas in six adjoining coal mines in central Colombia killed at least 11 workers and trapped 10 below ground. Rescue teams and ambulances labored at six adjoining mines to find the 10 missing miners. 
A second group of 2,000 gang members was moved to a controversial Salvadorian mega prison. El Salvador's government moved thousands of suspected gang members to the newly opened mega prison following President Nayib Bukele's anti gang push that has caused the Central American nation's prison population to soar. The United Nations Yemen mediator urged warring parties to seize the opportunity to take decisive steps towards peace and said that momentum to end the conflict had been renewed by a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran to resume ties. The geology of Brazil's volcanic Trinidad Island has been fascinated scientists for years, but the discovery of the rocks made from plastic debris in this remote turtle refuge is sparking alarm as researchers say that it's evidence that humans are influencing Earth's geological cycle. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end off tonight's broadcast with the opening of the Hong Kong Flower Show that added luster to Victoria Park with around 400,000 flower plants from 10 countries and regions brought to diffuse aroma and displace diverse charms. Thank you for watching, stay safe and have a good night.